Uh, welcome today. Uh, today I've got with me Jordan Bonner, I've got uh, Pip France and Robin Patterson and Jess Sheely from Public Services. Uh, all of these four have recently participated in the Lessons from Auschwitz project run by the Holocaust Education Trust. Uh, and we're going to start to just discuss how they've, having completed the project now, they're now going into their own part about how they're going to deliver their experiences to the rest of the college. So just to start off with, Jess, can you just explain to us what were your motivations behind getting involved in this project? Well, in GCC history, we've done a lot of World War II Holocaust informational kind of stuff. So it was just really interesting to read about it and I wanted to expand my knowledge. So I wanted to get involved and go see what it was like in real person. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, Robin, was yours very similar or was it a different story about why you wanted to get involved? Um, yeah, I was always interested in... World War Two and learning about it throughout my life really and um, it was sort of hard to believe that events like that did happen so it was nice to well not nice but it was an experience to go see what it was like okay so Jordan and both both Jordan and Pip um, were involved as members of staff going on the trip Pip why was what why did you ask to be involved because you were quite a late addition to the, mm. the little project team yes I was uh, and luckily enough I was given a place on the uh, on the project, and I'm I'm so grateful to be to have been involved because I think for something so profound to have happened in the history of this world and in kind of generations that we connect with on a day to day basis, I think it's so important that we continue to pass on the message and learn as much as we can about what happened, not only in Krakow and in Auschwitz and Birkenau, but throughout that that time period and in all of the camps as well. I just think it's so important that we continue to pass on the message so that not only is it does it never happen again, but the people that sadly pass away there are never forgotten. Okay. Uh, Jordan, is the same motivation? Because you've been really wanting to go for about a year, we spoke before. <laughs> yeah, I think um, for me, from a marketing perspective as well, I wanted to really show through imagery, if you like, how harrowing the place is because if you've never been or never had the opportunity to go, I think it's good to... Um, to see it and at least sort of give you an idea of, of what those people went through. And I think um, from a from a personal point of view, um, I wanted to go just to really try and connect with those people that, you know, particularly the survivors as well, who we may never hear from again. So, yeah, it was a really real personal journey, but um, with a good motive as well, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I was involved in the project last year and I had the same motivations and I've been teaching the Holocaust for a good few years. Um we we'll go back to Robin this time. Robin, you went on the first seminar, was to go to London, and you got to hear a Holocaust survivor. How did that, that actual day where you started to learn a little bit more and you heard that testimony, how did that make you feel on that day? Um, I think it really put into perspective like the amount of people that were involved and the individuals that were involved. Because Ziggy, he was he was so lovely. like He was a funny character. And um, it just, like you could think that there were so many more people like Ziggy, like not like Ziggy, like just different people. And it was quite, it really did like put into perspective the amount, like you'd sit there and think six million, but you can't, you can't see that. But when you hear from someone who's experienced it, it puts it really differently. I think that if I can interject here, that the, 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 the an appropriate word for Ziggy's testimony is, is that it humanises the Holocaust mm. um, because we go through school and we're educated through many different ways about the Holocaust and it's kind of it's portrayed as this brutal thing but Ziggy came across in such a, a comedic way he was, he was funny, he was charming about it but he tried to put across that no matter what happens you just carry on, you carry on, you carry on but it really did humanise the Holocaust for us um, and I think it was the perfect setup for the, the, the trip to Krakow. I think it was it, okay. it couldn't have been set up more appropriately. Because we, we talk about, particularly these two come from the public services and about us in education, and we talk about resilience. Do you mm. think Ziggy showed I real think, examples of resilience? I think, I think he is the epitome of resilience, um, uh, dogged determination, grit. I mean, some of the his testimony was, although it was, it, he did speak very well, he did portray some incredibly profound issues, um, his hunger, his thirst, he, the way he was treated, um, and I, th I think it was ju it's just remarkable. Um, and, and a lot of 
what he said can be taken by my generation, and I'm including the two girls in my generation because I'm a young teacher, mm. um, we can take lessons from what he says and implement them into everyday life because we moan about silly things um, and he has experienced the worst of what life has to offer but he just, no matter what happened, carried on to his uh, on his true course. Yeah. So if we move Jess to you, um, what most struck you and what did you learn from both the seminars and the visit to Poland do you think? So we moved on to the kind of, we went to Auschwitz in the trip. Well I think the first seminar, I talked about talking about Ziggy, the first thing that really struck with me was when he said he was about travelling from uh, his home place to Auschwitz in the cattle cars he said how can I as a 12 year old boy wish for someone to die so I can sit down and that just really struck a like a chord in me and how insane it was and how insane the conditions were and how badly everyone was treated so taking that to Auschwitz with me and then actually seeing the cattle cars and they said that they fitted 80 people into this tiny little car it was just I don't know really difficult to comprehend so yeah Thank you. And Jordan? What? Um, <clears throat> I think that initial seminar was not what I was expecting at all. When I found out you know, the subject was like pre-war Jewish history, I didn't really know what to expect, but it set up the trip nicely because then when you went, all you could hear, everywhere you went, all I could hear was sort of the echo of Ziggy's words, a bit like Jess said, you know, when you, when you see the cart and you remember what he said and you see the living conditions and you're walking on a ground where, you know, some people spent their last their last days, their last hours even. Um, so I think what I took particularly from the uh, from Ziggy's testimony and particularly from um, the, the initiation part was that you can't really prepare yourself for what you're about to see you have to just sort of go there and take it for face value which um if you had any predetermined ideas of what it was going to be like they'd be blown out of the water because as soon as you see it yeah your mind changes instantly okay so robin you then went to auschwitz and birkenhau how did that trip what, what was your experiences of that day um so when we first went to auschwitz one um it was quite like it was really packed, like there was a lot of people and um, it was difficult to experience like how it would have felt for other, like for mm. people who were there, um, just cause you couldn't like imagine it because like what it was like around you. Um, but as soon as we stepped into Birkenau, I think it completely changed. Like, I think there was definitely a silence within the group. Like no one didn't know what to say but when we was going through Auschwitz one looking at the expeditions it was like we could have discussions and like we could talk about like what was going on but Birkenau it was a totally different experience just because it was so like you couldn't put a, I could personally I couldn't put a scale on it like I couldn't compare it to anything I was thinking is it a football stadium is it bigger is it smaller like you can't put a scale on it it was unbelievable but Auschwitz like you can see each end in Auschwitz but it was completely different to that now. Pip, for you? Yeah, so I, um, just to kind of, as a precursor to, to what I'll say about Alfreds and Birkenau, I'm, I'm a person that likes to have an understanding of things in my private life, in my work life. I like to have, I like to know what's going on, why it's going on, and, and, and with Alfreds and Birkenau and the, and the Holocaust in general, I don't have an understanding. I think it's very hard for an individual to gain an understanding, and I'm okay with that um, because it was so barbaric, and the actions of the Nazi Party and the SS were so abnormal to what we understand now that I was fine with on the day not having an understanding. But the the trip itself, um, to start off with, it's a very early flight. You know, we 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 get to the airport at kind of three in the morning, and everyone's a bit bleary eyed and caught thinking, right, okay, here we go. Um, we then you hop on a coach, you drive into the town of Schwenchen and you're thinking you're going to see some some barracks and yeah it will be quite an emotional experience but you, nothing can prepare you for actually driving down that road turning to your right and seeing Auschwitz 1 right um, and then it's a bizarre experience because you've got so many tourists trying to get packed into this old Polish barracks that, that that's quite a bizarre experience. But then you go in and you, you, you have, we had a brilliant tour guide who, who knew her stuff down to the T. Um, and you start entering into these barracks and seeing artifacts, personal artifacts of the prisoners. You start seeing human hair. 
you start seeing physical evidence of the way these people were treated and that kind of and again that word humanizes it humanizes it for you um, but I, I would agree with Robin that the Auschwitz one was it was quite packed and it was kind of hustle and bustle um, and I, I one thing I will never forget is Rudolf Hearst's house uh, because it was it was just a kind of residential house you could put it in Dartford and no one would have any qualm with it, it being it seemed like for me the same it was like yeah. there's all that madness and yeah. all that but then there's that calmness and yeah. it's like this was someone that just it's almost like you and I and everybody else goes home at the end of a day at college yeah. and go home it was like yeah. that was their job and he had his family and there and he had his family and there and it was yeah. just and went they, home yeah and they lived a normal family life there and so he would kind of live his working day through putting people through hell and then go home and mm. talk to his children about the ways of life so there's a massive kind of contrast there mm. and then we at the end of Auschwitz 1 we went into the gas chamber which was um, it then kind of it had already partially sunk in the, the extent to which these people went mm. to punish the prisoners but the, the gas chambers were something incredibly profound um, because it was such a rudimentary building but it holds such impotence you know it's such importance mm. because thousands of people were killed in there and there are scratch marks on the wall and then you went around to the corner and you could see where these people were were, were burned you know um, having done Auschwitz 1 uh, you kind of we got back on the coach and then you drive to Birkenau and then that provides you with a whole new scope on the Holocaust in general and people often associate Auschwitz with the guard tower that photo of Birkenau mm. Um, and it is it's remarkable because you can't see the ends. It goes on forever. It goes on to the horizon. Um, and I think it's something like four kilometres wide on from one side and then six kilometres in length. Um, and you, you can't... That's where I you kind of think to yourself, this is this is so barbaric, um, but I, I can't get an understanding of, of mm. how, how that actually physically manifests itself, how that was allowed to happen. You know, the, the iconic train tracks going in, and then you've got the different camps on the left and right, which are separate for, for, separate for women, the gypsies, and, the, and then the Jewish prisoners. Um, and there, there are so many things that can be said about Birkenau, but I think the, the poignant... I have two moments from, from Birkenau that, that will really stick in my, my mind. The crematorium two attempted to be destroyed by the Germans, so they 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 kind of prophesied that they were doing the right thing and that they were trying to work towards this Aryan race and they had no shame about it. Yet they tried to destroy the evidence that would in eventually incriminate them, right? Um, and then the second poignant moment for me was at the end of the day we had a rabbi with us for the visit and he led a ceremony at the end of the day um, in the room where the prisoners would come in and they would get their tattoos and I found it such uh, a profound thing that there was a rabbi singing a prayer in Hebrew in a building where Jews were persecuted and it was the actual physical persecution in that building and I found that, that quite remarkable. Yeah. So Jess was that your experience as well of Birkenhau or was yours a little bit different? No, I was very much similar to Pip and Robin with the Auschwitz Birkenau was a very eerie, very dark, very daunting place. Whereas Auschwitz One felt a lot more like a museum because in all the rooms there mm. were glass cases of prosthetics and glasses and things like that. So yeah, it was really odd seeing how personal items, because the prosthetics are personal items, mm. it's legs and it's arms and it's crutches, which everyone has their own personal um one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was really odd to walk in and see that in a glass case and how many there were. So many shoes and so much hair. I think it was either 700 kilograms of hair from people. It's just an insane amount. Mm. So it was like a museum in Auschwitz, but Birkenau was a very different very place and you could see how they'd changed their mindsets at the end of the war to try and destroy the crematoriums and the gas chambers from they realised maybe it wasn't such a good thing that they mm. were doing that, but yeah, it's very odd. It's almost like it was a hiding up process. Yeah. 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 Okay. Jordan, what did you take as you left Auschwitz Birkenau and you got back on a coach and you got back in a nice airport and you yeah. had something to eat and you kind of dried off a little bit because it was a really awful day? Oh, it was horrendous. The weather, how, I think. How was that a contrast to I think, what you yeah, spent I th the day? I think the weather played a part in making it what it was, I think, because that's exactly how I envisaged it being wet, cold, foggy. And that just added to the experience. But yeah, for me, when I came back, it's when it all started, really. All the questions, all the 
um, the, the looking into stuff because when you're there you're making sure you look at everything you know in the gas chamber you want to make sure you look and see and and, and touch everything but it's when you come back that all the, all the questions started coming up you know why did this happen how did it happen it was an incredible feat of um, engineering to put the place together but then t in order to, to organize the logistics and it, it just it completely fried my brain thinking about it so I've spent <laughs> literally every day since I've come back looking it up listening to documentaries listening to the Nuremberg trials afterwards listening to anything I can just to try and gauge an understanding of it and, and if I hadn't have gone I wouldn't have known any of the things that I know now about the Holocaust simply from um, wanting to look it up after being there and seeing such a um, you know, a horrendous place, but yeah, I think uh, it, it definitely gives you a different um, perspective on things. And like Pip said earlier, you know, we complain about the simple things in life, but what these guys went through and and what I've witnessed has made me completely change the way I think about day to day things. Really, so it is a bit of a shock when you come back and you go back into a sanitised kind of back into your day to day living, and you come away from Birkenau, particularly for me, it was Birkenau and you're back in today living and you get I had this real desire to want to pass on this message to others I don't know about you so yeah. since you've been back uh, Pip what do you want to pass on to others yeah I think I think that is the that is the crux of what we're trying to get up through this trip right we we must make sure that and, and the LFA do a brilliant job they organise everything so precisely and they, they get the right testimonies in and, and they know their stuff right I think it is it's imperative that we do just talk to people about it there's no need to feel awkward about it. We, we must talk to people, talk to friends, talk to family, talk to peers. As, as teachers, we must talk to our students about it. We must talk to people that we can influence. Um, and I think the, it's so important for, for, for a younger generation to un have gain as much of an understanding as they can. Because yeah, it was, it was a rainy day and everyone was soaked and everyone was tired. And we were walking out of Birkenau um, and I had a couple of students made, made, make remarks of, oh, I really should want to go home now, which is fair enough, you know. But you have to think, those prisoners that were held at Birkenau had apps that that thought, it, it wasn't even allowed to be held, right? They had to stay there, they were famished, they were, they were treated so poorly. And I think that's why we need to pass the message so that no one is treated like that ever again. And we can see it in, in modern life, there is still genocide happening mm. and people are still being persecuted because of whatever it may be, their ethnic uh, origins, their, their religion. And I think that the Holocaust can be not compared, but it can be relevant to, to, to modern, modern day, day genocide and discrimination. Okay, thank you Pip. Uh, Robin? Um, I also think that, I agree with what Pip said, but the memory of Auschwitz and the Holocaust and all parties that were involved, I don't think it should ever, never, like, not be remembered. I think it's such an, like, an important event in history that without it, stuff wouldn't happen. So, like, genocide, even though it goes on today, maybe, like, down the years, like, it wouldn't get as bad as the Holocaust was, because I think the Holocaust was horrendous. Like, it was so bad, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But, yeah. Okay, so just the, the, the aim of the, uh, the, the Lessons from Auschwitz project is to highlight what can happen if prejudice and racism become acceptable. Yeah. Do you think that you got that outcome from that? Did you see what could happen if we allow... You definitely saw the impact of how prejudice and how one person's opinion can infect so many others because it wasn't just Hitler, it was the other people, it was all the SS, it, SS, it was all of the other people that got involved and agreed with what was going on that really made it a lot harder for the Jews and everyone else to survive in that kind of day-to-day -day life. Like many neighbours snitched, as if you would say, mm. um, on the Jews that were trying to hide and that just, the prejudice that was against them was so, um, I don't know, sat insane in some ways mm. that this group of people were prosecuted because of what they believed and you could see the impact of how that affected them and how many people there were no Jews left in or spies them um, because of this and you wouldn't want to go back of it because it is tainted by this so it's very influential I think in do you think life. That that's a message that we you know we live in a climate that's changing now don't we yeah definitely. do you think that that's a message that's still contemporary today I think it definitely shows us how prosecution can just build up and build up and build up and impact on so many people in so many ways. 
it should definitely not happen again in modern day life. Okay. Uh, yeah, if I think there are many different questions that can can come from the Holocaust, and I think that that yes, we do need to keep passing on the message, but many different questions that can be had. Uh, for example, do you think that the persecutors are animals inhumane for what they did? Um, and, and it's an interesting debate that can be had because there are there are opposing sides to it. Many people suggest that they were simply following orders, and that those orders came from high above them, and they had no choice. Um, however, many feel that yes, they were animalistic and completely. It was done with complete spite towards ethnic minorities. Um, I think it's important that we keep having these debates amongst peers and and future generations because it does keep the subject alive, which which needs to happen. It does need to happen. I mean, it's a message that's seventy five years old, and as we come to the the beginning of twenty twenty. It's 75 years since World War Two ended, um, and that message, probably for me, because my granddad served in World War Two. Some of you may have great grandparents because you are older than I. You're younger than I am. Sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> um, you're younger than I am, but for me, it, I remember my granddad talking about it and just how a powerful message it is that they really believed that they were fighting to stop. So it's still a mess. I'm not really explaining this very well, but the message is that. You know, 75 years on, do you think, Jordan, that that message is still a really strong message that we are still fighting mm. for that freedom, really? That, definitely. You know, that yeah, definitely. I think you only have to look at, I mean, we were discussing it on the on the second um, on the second meeting about, um, you know, how in Russia that gay marriage is still, mm. um, you know, illegal. And that is in no way any less than, than the persecution that the, the Jews faced in, you know, in the 1940s because it's, it's exactly the same premise. It's, a, it's something that they believe in um, and nobody should have that right taken away from them. And we're lucky that we live in a society now where, you know, hopefully that, that kind of extremist view isn't taken by, by so many people. But what scares me the most is that one person managed to, to do that and, and they mentioned it in the meeting that the scary thing is someone else could still do it you know it's still possible that one person um could bring about so much hatred so i think the the the, the message is clear particularly for us that went as well is to let people know that you know these are the consequences of what can happen if the wrong people get into into power um and if you haven't been there and witnessed it yourself it's important that we pass that on um to ensure it doesn't happen again i think we probably all feel like that because we're all sort of singing and we've all from the same hymn sheet we've all been mm -hmm. but for you two you know we're working us three but you two you're hoping to enter into the public services some of these public services have had examples of where they were seen as being racist do you think that this is an important message for you to take into your job roles definitely um you need to make sure that you're not judging someone by the way they appear to you you need to think about who they are as a person and humanize them rather than just judge on face value so race or ethnicity or anything like that or even how they present themselves as in gender or sexual orientation so many people discriminate and prejudice against these people that going into roles such as the police and the army you need to be really careful about what you're saying what you're doing and how you present yourself when dealing with these kind of people or any people in general just trying to treat everyone equally so yeah okay I think I, th I think yeah just just following on from that I think there are many contemporary issues now that can be related back to the Holocaust um, because as I alluded to earlier there there, there have been genocides mm, on planet earth f for thousands of years and and sadly I think I'm of the opinion that, that it, they will never stop however it's the scale of the Holocaust that is quite remarkable um, and it has such a negative impact on one group of people. Um, I was lucky enough to sit next to the rabbi on the plane out and we had a brilliant conversation and I asked him how does it feel, I asked him quite a personal question, I said how did the Holocaust, how does the Holocaust make you feel about you practicing your faith? And we had a brilliant conversation. And I asked the same to Ziggy, actually, on the first seminar. I said, how did, after the Holocaust had, had passed and you had, you had come to terms with it as much as you could, I said, how did it, I, I posed the question, how did it affect your ability to, to practice your faith? And he said, for, for a few years after, I hated God. I wouldn't go to the synagogue. I wouldn't practice at all. 
But once you think about these things, and, and he said, once I took some time to think, actually God had no part to play because it was just pure evil that, that dictated what happened in the Holocaust. So back to my original point, many contemporary issues can, can be related back to the Holocaust. And that's why I think it's so important that we continue carrying on the message. And that's why it's so important that the Holocaust Education Trust keep doing their job because they do a, a, such a phenomenal job. Uh, they really know their stuff and they organise these brilliant trips not only for the students but for members of staff as well because we can always keep learning and passing on the message to the, uh, the future generations.